you have given yourself to us. What an amazing, amazing truth that is. And so far beyond anything we could ever begin to understand, it's just amazing to even contemplate the fact that you have given yourself through your Son, Jesus Christ, coming into this world to be a part of humanity, to take upon Himself human flesh, the Creator becoming one of His created so that we through Him might come to enjoy the life that you offer through your Son, Jesus Christ. Now, I pray today that as we just think about that and allow that thought to just sink into our souls, deep into our spirits, I pray that it would, it would so engulf us with the majesty and the magnitude of your love and grace that we would simply be overwhelmed and overcome. As we turn our attention now to a study of your word, our prayers that you would speak to us and encourage us, that you would challenge us to be different because your word calls us to be different. And we live in a society that so desperately needs to see the difference that Jesus Christ really makes in the life of a genuine, sincere believer. I pray that you would, you would encourage us today to give ourselves completely to the instruction that you will give us through the biblical narrative that we will consider this morning and use it for your glory and use it for our good. Our prayer is made in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I don't know what caused me. I, I, I hope and pray that it was the uh, Holy Spirit that caused me to think about this question about how we treat other people. How do we treat people? Social media is, well, it's evil. I mean, I don't, I don't know any better way to put it. It, it. it can be a tool used for good. Please don't misunderstand me. And there are so many people that do use it as a tool for good, but there are so many who use it as a tool of evil. Jesus told us that we should treat other people the way we would like for those people to treat us. It, it was a common Greek philosophical thought that was already ingrained in society when Jesus came on the scene that taught people to not treat others the way you would not want them to treat you. And so it sounds sort of similar to what Jesus said. But it stops woefully short. Don't do to others what you would not want them to do to you. Just simply means I can be passive. I don't have to do anything. I just need to refrain from treating them with ill will or evil intent. I, I guess if a lot of people would live by that philosophy, it would improve their behavior. But, but Jesus said that's not enough. It's not enough just not to do something you need to do to something. Don't just refrain from treating other people the way you would not want them to treat you, but go out of your way to treat them the way you want to be treated. So it takes them out of the realm of passivity into the realm of action. Hmm. So who does that apply to? Does it just apply to people I like? It's easy to do good to those that I like. It's, it's easy to do good to have kindness at, at heart and in my intent. It's easy to do good to those that I like, that I love. But what about, what about those people I don't like? It's not quite so easy, is it? Jesus said, go out of your way to bless those who curse you. Wow. <coughs> Do good to those who would spitefully use you. That puts it on a whole new plane. <coughs> those people who actually intend my harm whether it be a verbal assault, a physical assault, it really doesn't matter what form it takes. Those people who would wrong me, who would harm me, I am supposed to respond by doing something kind for them? I don't, I 
particularly like that. Because, you know, I, I guess it's part of the human makeup that when somebody does something to me, I, I want to return evil for evil. I want to return hurt for hurt. If they lash down at me, I want to lash back at them. I mean, isn't that the human way? Aren't we supposed to defend ourselves? Aren't we supposed to take up for ourselves? Aren't we supposed to fight back? <laughs> Not according to Jesus. If someone smites you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. If, if someone compels to you to walk along carrying his coat for a mile, go in. Go the extra mile. Carry it too. If somebody is really making life miserable for you, go out of your way to make life pleasurable for them. That's tough stuff, isn't it? I mean, let's, let's face the fact that that is really tough stuff. And I watch people, you know, I, I've said before, and you've heard me say before, that I'm sort of a people watcher. When I'm in a public place, I sort of just observe. I just watch how people act and react. Mostly how they react. And sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not so good. Sometimes they do pretty well in responding and sometimes not so much. And then I think about me. How do I respond? How do I react? How do I treat other people, especially those people who don't necessarily like me? Now, I know that's a shock to you. I'm such a lovable and likable character. You know it's, it's... No, there are people who don't like me. There are people who don't love me, just like there's people who don't like you and don't love you. And some of them, you know, they may be just passive and they may, may never really do anything actively to cause you any kind of harm. But then there are probably some who would, if given the opportunity would make life pretty miserable for you. How do you treat them? 1 Samuel chapter 26 gives us a graphic illustration to answer that question. Because in this passage, we've got three different people that are focused on in the text, and all three of them treat other people differently. So I want us to just read together the first 12 verses of 1 Samuel chapter 26. And then I want us to focus our attention on three men, Saul and Abishai and David. So if you will, stand with me for just a moment as we read this passage together. Now the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is David not hiding in the hill of Hakeelah, opposite Jeshimon? Then Saul rose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph having 3,000 chosen men of Israel with him to seek David in the wilderness of Zip. And Saul encamped in the hill of Hakilah, which is opposite Jeshimon by the road, but David stayed in the wilderness, and he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness. David therefore sent out spies, and understood that Saul had indeed come. So David arose and came to the place where Saul had encamped, and David saw the place where Saul lay, and Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of Saul's army. Now Saul lay within the camp, with the people encamped all around him. And then David answered and said to Ahimelech the Hittite, and to Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, brother of Joab, saying, Who will go down with me to Saul in the camp? And Abishai said, I'll go down with you. So David and Abishai came to the people by night, and there Saul lay, sleeping within the camp, with his spear stuck in the ground by his head, and Abner and the people lay all around him. Then Abishai said, David, God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now therefore, please, let me strike him at once with the spear, right to the earth. I won't have to strike him a second time. And David said to Abishai, do not destroy him. For who can stretch down his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? 
David said, furthermore, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall go out to battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointing. But please, take me out a spear and the jug of water that lay by his head, and let's go. So David took the spear and the jug of water by Saul's head, and they got away, and no man saw or knew. For they were all asleep because of deep sleep for the Lord had fallen on them. Father, would you please just add your blessings and give us an understanding of your work and pray us in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I, I get on uh, Facebook two or three times a day. First thing in the morning I get on just to see who said what. Midday, if, I, if I'm at home, I, I'll get on it again. And then Usually late at night, I'll get back home and on my Kindle when I go to bed, and just, just to see who has said what. <laughs> Sometimes I wish I hadn't. Sometimes I'm glad I did. Sometimes I see people that I know who have said some really unkind things. They're just sort of airing their dirty laundry for everybody to see. Is that really what we want to do? Is it, do we really want to let everybody know what we think about so-and-so and what so-and-so said or what so-and-so did and how miserable they made me? Do I really want to let everybody know about that? Well, if I do, if I do now, listen carefully, it's only because I intend harm to that person. You might say, no, preacher, I'm just venting. No, you're not. No, you're not. You're doing harm to those. Well, preacher, you don't know what they did to me or said about me. or It doesn't matter. It simply does not matter what they said, what they did, how <laughs> wicked or evil their intent was. It really does not matter. Not according to what Jesus says to us. Jesus says we are to go out of our way to do good to those who hurt us, that would want to harm us, that have spitefully used us, that have verbally abused us. Jesus says don't retaliate. It's not up to you to retaliate. Paul says vengeance is mine, said the Lord. It, it's, not, it's not for me to take vengeance on anyone for anything. That's God's work. But wait a minute now, preacher. Are we supposed to stand up for ourselves? Don't we have rights? Well, no, you don't. Paul said that I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who, gave, who loved me and gave himself for me. I am crucified with Christ. I'm a dead man. What rights do a dead man have? Seriously. I'm not trying to be morbid here this morning. I'm just trying to get our thought juices flowing. What, what rights does a dead man have? I can't think of one, can you? All rights die when physical death overtakes us. We have no rights. So as a dead man, as a man who is dead in Christ, yet living now in the flesh by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, then my life is supposed to be his life being lived out through me. And if my life is supposed to be his life being lived through me, then... How Jesus reacted to evil should be the way that I react to evil. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You might say, but wait a minute, preacher, there's a difference now. They know exactly what they're doing. <laughs> they mean me harm. Well, they meant Jesus harm, too. They knew exactly what they were doing. And so when Jesus says that he forgave them, 
He was giving us the example that we are to be of others. As a matter of fact, when Jesus gave us the model prayer, at the conclusion of the model prayer, He said very plainly, if you won't forgive others, then your Heavenly Father will not forgive you. That's how important this matter is. So how I treat other people must be pretty important to God. So I want us to think about these three guys, okay? I think, that, first of all, we're thinking about Saul. Saul's philosophy of life was to do unto others before they do unto you. Let's get them before they get us. Now it's interesting. This story of David and Saul is a very interesting story. And I don't have time to recap it all, but you're very familiar with most of it anyway. You'll, you'll remember that God had, he had chosen Saul to be the first king of Israel. And there's some interesting physical characteristics about Saul. It tells us in the text that Saul stood head and shoulders above everybody else. Undoubtedly, Saul was a pretty good-sized guy. Now, you need to remember that. Because there's going to come to the day that Saul and the army of Israel is at the valley of Megiddo, and their army is on one side of the valley, and the army of the Philistines is on the other side of the valley. And there's a giant over on the Philistine side who is taunting the army of Israel. You remember, his name is Goliath. Goliath stood nine and a half feet tall. He was a pretty big guy. Nine and a half feet tall. Now, we don't know exactly how tall Saul was, but let's just assume, let's just assume that if he's head and shoulders above everybody else, let's just assume that there's somebody of Israelite descent, that's 6'2", okay? Let's just assume that. <coughs> Saul is at least 6 to 8 inches taller than the tallest. So if the tallest is hypothetically 6'2", then Saul is about 6'10". Now, I realize that's still almost 3 feet shorter than a 9 and a half foot tall giant by the name of Goliath, but just picture this. Goliath is screaming out across the valley, taunting the army of Israel, calling for one person to be strong enough and brave enough and courageous enough to come over and fight him in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Now, yes, Saul is still a good bit smaller than Goliath. But Saul is the king. Saul is larger than anybody else in the army of Israel. And Saul is cowering somewhere in his tent, shaking in fear. Well, now, here comes this ruddy little guy named David. The only reason he's there is to check on his brothers. David comes, and his brothers begin to scold him because they say, all you wanted to do is come and see the battle. Oh, you're, you're just so wicked in your mind. And David just sort of ignored what his brothers were saying. And he walked over and said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? And, and listen to what he's saying about the God of Israel. Now David's, he's showing a courage that nobody else is showing, right? He, I mean, he is courageous enough to go to Saul and say, listen, I'll take care of that uncircumcised giant. He's defying the armies of the living God. He, he doesn't have a chance against the God of Israel. Let me at him. This is a ruddy little, fine-looking young guy. The Bible says he was handsome in his appearance. And Saul says, you can't possibly go. That's a, he, he's been trained all of his life to be a military power giant, and you are just a shepherd. And so David then begins to tell Saul, what? I was out keeping my father's sheep and there was a bear that came and I killed him with my hands and on another occasion there was a lion that came and I killed him with my bare hands. I'll do the same thing to this Philistine giant. And so Saul, the courageous king of Israel, gives it over to a little shepherd boy. Now he says, okay, you've got to put on all this armor. And so he puts all of his, Saul's armor, on David. And you can imagine how ridiculous that would look. Here's Saul probably stands about 6, 8, 6, 10. Here's David. We don't know how big he was when he was a young boy. He was quite a bit smaller than Saul. And you can imagine how humorous that would have looked. And, and David says, I can't do this. I can't wear this. I've never worn this before. I don't even know how it works. So take it all off. 
and I'll go take care of the giant. And we know the story. He picked up five stones, he walked down, and he killed the giant with just one stone, sunk it directly into his forehead. Goliath fell over. David picked up his sword, cut off his head. And all the people of Israel began shouting accolades to David. David and Saul go back into the city after this great victory. And all the people are singing, Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed his tens of thousands. And immediately Saul is moved with such envy and jealousy that he decides he's going to kill David. And he makes several attempts to kill David prior to this. And this is the second time that he's actually taken the whole army of Israel to look for this one guy, David, to kill him. David's already spared his life one time. And now in chapter 26, it tells us that they come to this place and once again Saul and his army is there and David and his few hundred men are with him. And then David asks, who, who will go down with me? And Abishai is the one who responded and said, I'll go. But, but think with me about Saul for just a moment. Just think about how enraged he was with jealousy. He was so jealous because God was using David in a way that he had never used Saul. Now Saul had been the military leader for the people of Israel. They had already engaged in battle several times prior. And God had given them victory. So he was certainly a powerful military giant. But when this one young shepherd boy named David begins getting more attention and more applause and more accolades than Saul, Saul is so enraged with jealousy. And he sets his life, his life goal now is to get rid of David. All of his efforts center around getting rid of David. That is so unbelievable. But think about you, and think about when somebody has wronged you. Now David had not wronged Saul, but let's think about you, and, and that person who has wronged you in some way. You set your heart on getting even, seeking revenge. The effort of life becomes, what can I do to make him miserable? What can I do to get back? And so you set your heart on getting them before they can do anything else to you. And just the seed of bitterness and anger can quickly become hatred and malice. And we can quickly become consumed with thoughts of doing harm, causing hurt to someone else. And we might think, well, they deserve it. They absolutely deserve everything that they could ever get. I hope they hurt, and I hope they hurt with an intensity that nobody's ever known before. That's what happens when we allow that seed of anger to just take root in our heart and in our spirit and begin to sprout. We want to get even. We want to cause hurt because they hurt us. So one philosophy of life that we can operate by is this. Let's do unto others before they do unto us. But there's a, a second guy in this story, a, a guy named Abisha. And Abisha had a different philosophy. His philosophy was, hey, let's do the same thing to them they're doing to us. Saul has absolutely gone insane, which he had. Saul has gone completely crazy, and we better, we better get to him, and we better do something. As a matter of fact, David, why don't you just do to him what he's doing to you? Just Let's just be fair about this. <coughs> there, there are a few characteristics of Abishai's statement here, this statement of, let's get it. God has delivered him to you. That's interesting. Yet God has delivered this guy into your hands, David. 
It's undoubtedly God's will for you to kill him and for you to take the throne because God has delivered this guy into your hands. So Abishai was making this real personal. He, he was taking it so personally that Saul has done you such harm, he has caused you such pain, he has caused the people of Israel, the whole nation to suffer because of his insanity. Let's just get him back. So it was a personal endeavor, but it was also a practical thing because undoubtedly, undoubtedly Abishai thought, okay, this is the way you can take over the throne. You see, David has already been anointed by Samuel to be the next king. That's already taken place. David can't become king until Saul is dethroned in some way, you know, either by, by a coup of the people or, or by death or by dying in battle. You know, Saul has somehow got to be removed. And so Abishai now, okay, here he is. The same time they come upon Saul, the lay him asleep. The first time David has already spared Saul's life, here he is the second time, and, and Abishai says, hey, David, you need to understand something. God has delivered Saul into your hands. Let's just kill him. And isn't it interesting what Abishai says? Let me strike him once to the ground. I won't need him again. You know? I'm going to make it work the first time. So it was a, it was a practical conclusion to their dilemma. Let's just get it over with. This is the way he's been treating you, David. God's not going to think any ill toward you if you just retaliate. And the kingdom will be yours. So it was a powerful, powerful temptation. Because, as I've already said, Samuel has already anointed David as the successor to the throne in Israel. Saul just has to be removed from the throne and all the power of the king would be given to David. Now maybe Abishai had some selfish motives here. You know, Abishai and Joab, their brothers, and they're sort of second in command. And, and maybe Abishai had some selfish motivation here. Maybe he thought, okay, David, you get to the throne and Joab and I are going to be on the right hand and the left hand of you when you come into your kingdom. So maybe there was some selfish motivation. Or maybe it was just that Abishai was trying to protect David's reputation. And maybe Abishai sincerely just saw this, as, as he says here, God has delivered him into your hand. Maybe he actually believed that this was a divine act of God. Sometimes we might get confused about things. Some, sometimes someone may hurt you. And then you find yourself in a prime place where you can get even. And the thought might come to your mind, God must want me to get even with this person because he's put us in the same place at the same time and the circumstances are just right for me to get even. And we might misread the, the situation. You might say, well, preacher, how do you know? Well, you know because God never intends for you to get revenge. There's really no question about that. It's either a selfish motivation or it's a satanic motivation. God is never, ever going to put you in a position where you can get revenge because He says He has revenge. It belongs to him, never to us. Well, Abishai totally misunderstood that. He totally misunderstood the circumstances now that had arisen because God had once again, for the second time, put them in a prime place. Saul laying asleep. His whole army is asleep. God has undoubtedly put them all into a deep trance and nobody even knows we're here. He's able to walk right up to where Saul lays asleep. And Abishai says, this has got to be the will of God. Let's do it. Sometimes, sometimes from things people say on social media, it seems like that's what they believe. 
God has given me this outlet where I can just vent. I can lay on the, I don't have to call their name because they know who they are. Nobody else needs to know who they are, but I can just unload them on social media. God must intend for me to do that or He wouldn't have given me this computer with access to the internet, with a Facebook account that gives me freedom to say what I want to say. It's got to be God, right? Yeah, right. Just like other, any other ill intent is of God. No, nah, never, never. God never intends us to seek revenge, to try to cause someone hurt that has caused us hurt. Saul said, okay, here's what I want to do. I want to get David before he gets me because he already knew the throne's going to be David's. Abishai says, no, 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 no. Let's just get him. He's been treating you this way. Let's just do right back to him what he's done to us. David, don't you remember that it's Saul's fault that we're having to run around like fugitives? We're having to flee from place to place because we're always, he's always on our trail and we're always having to stay one step ahead. Don't you know how miserable he's made life for us? And now God's just put him right here. He's in the crosshairs. Let me just shoot him. Just like sometimes we just like to shoot people. Not necessarily with a gun or a bow, but words. <coughs> There's a third philosophy. David, David seems to be bigger than life. Doesn't he? He's, he's one of those characters in the Bible. This, he just seems to be bigger than life. So Abishai says, oh, okay, God has delivered him into your hand. Let me just kill him. And David's philosophy is, no, 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 no. That's not right. I'm going to treat Saul the way I wish Saul would treat me. I'm going to, before Jesus ever spoke the golden rule, David lived the golden rule. I'm going to do unto Saul the way I would like for Saul to do unto me. <coughs> takes a big person to do that, doesn't it? Takes a really big person to, to take all the junk that somebody else can hurl at them and turn it around for good. That's a big, big person. David was that kind of a person. David had a sacrificial desire about this whole thing. David was willing to sacrifice. Again, remember, God has already sent Samuel to anoint David as the successor to the throne of Israel. David already knows he's going to be king. And yet Saul is still on the throne. Saul is now in a place for the second time that they could easily take his life and David could ascend the throne. So David has to sacrifice. He has a sacrificial desire. Hey, I'm not going to take advantage of this situation. I'm not going to take advantage of, of this opportunity now that... Abishai, you, you see this as an opportunity given to us by God. I, I don't necessarily see it that way because I believe God anointed Saul as king and as long as he's on the throne, then I... I'll just have to sacrifice. Wow, well, that takes a really big person. It takes a really big person on that, on that job where, where there's, there's a spot of promotion that has come available. And you know it's between you and one other person. You know that. Everybody knows that. And you know that you're better qualified and you've got more time on the job. For some reason, maybe you know the reason, maybe you don't know the reason, but for some reason, you're passed over and the promotion is given to the other person. 
Well, you can begin a, a verbal campaign. You can begin using defamatory language against that person. You, you can begin cutting them down. You can begin telling other people that you just don't understand how you could have been passed over for that promotion because you're so much more qualified and you've got so much more time on the job. It was just totally unfair. Or you could take the high road. And you could congratulate sincerely. I'm, I'm not talking about superficially. You, you could congratulate the person for getting the promotion. You could go out of your way to be good to the person who has caused you loss. That's just one simple illustration of it, isn't it? That sometimes people set, set their heart on doing you harms wrong in some way. Whether they intend it or whether it's done by other parties is relevant. You're passed over for something or your cause hurt in some way. And, and you want to get back and you want to cause hurt and you want to inflict pain. And instead you choose the high road. You congratulate. You compliment. You sacrifice. David was willing to sacrifice. He, he had the desire to do that. He had the desire to be submissive. Now, here's a position in which he could have easily taken advantage of the situation, killed Saul, and ascended the throne. He could have done that. I'm not sure how well he would have been taken as king had he taken it in that way. I'm not sure the people of Israel would have ever been unified under his kingship had he done it that way. And I'm not sure that that was in David's mind. I'm not sure that he was thinking about that, but he was showing that he was submissive to God. Now we know he was submissive to God because he says, God has anointed Saul as king and far be it from me to strike out my hand against the Lord's anointed. He was submitting himself to God. Sometimes that's our only out, by the way. Sometimes we're called such deep hurt. We have experienced the infliction of such pain. <coughs> that we're just consumed with thoughts of revenge. <coughs> the only way you're going to get over that is to submit yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what they've done, what they've said, how often they've done it, how painful the experience, it doesn't really matter. What is important for us is to let it go. To submit to the teaching of the Word of God. So David's desire was to sacrifice the throne until God's appointed time, if and when that ever happens, to submit himself to the lordship of God over his life. And then the most important thing of all is that David's desire was spiritual. Abishai is looking at this from a totally physical standpoint. Okay, God has put him right here. He's laying asleep at our feet. All we've got to do is drive a pig through his temple. Let's do it, David. Abishai's whole perspective was physical. David's perspective was spiritual. And therein lies the difference, by the way, of how you're going to react, how you're going to treat others. It, it all comes down to whether you're going to react in the flesh or you're going to react in the spirit. If you react in the spirit, your intent is always to bless, to do good, to return kindness for evil. If you're operating in the flesh, then your intent and your desire is to seek revenge, to get even, to cause pain, to inflict harm. So we got three choices here in this passage of Scripture. Do to them before they do to me. Do to them as they've done to me. Or do to them the way I'd like for them to do to me. <coughs> Can I make a suggestion this morning? Simple suggestion. My mama taught me this a long, long time ago. This is this simple old cliche. You've all probably, every one of us probably were taught this by our parents. If you can't say something good, just don't say anything at all. Isn't that 
simple? Not so easy. Simple does not equate with easy. Because in my flesh, what I want to do is get even, get back, cause pain. But if I'm submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, I'm not going to seek revenge. I'm not going to try to get even. I'm actually going to reverse it. I'm actually going to go out of my way to do good to those who have hurt me. Let me close with this illustration. I'm done. As Pastor in Lockwood Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, for four years, God had blessed this church immensely. I don't remember now the number of uh, baptisms we had in that four-year period of time. It, it was quite a high number. Large church, and it was growing larger because of God's hand of grace on us. And we came to a time where we needed a new youth minister, and... Uh, we began taking resumes and had a personnel committee that was involved in the process of seeking the right person for the position. And we had this resume from a guy who at one time had been on staff at this same church that I was pastoring now. He had been on staff as an intern early on when he was early in his educational process. And, and so the people in the church said, hey, we know this guy. Well, we did some background checking on him, and we found out, no, he doesn't have a very good track record. Every, every church he's been in, he's causing pretty major problems. But because the people in the church thought they knew this guy, they said, hey, you know, we can help him through this. So we called him. We just totally ignored all the red flags. We called him. And within one year, everything that God had done in the four previous years was undone. It was amazing. It was amazing how this one man came on the scene and literally destroyed this church. As a matter of fact, this church no longer exists. It had over 1,500 members. And that doesn't even exist because of this guy. I'm going to be honest with you. When I got up on that Sunday night and resigned, because I, I don't have time to go into all the details, but because basically in a nutshell, the church was just refusing to see what this guy was doing, and I was trying to get them to take action, and, and they just refused to do it. And that, that night when I gave my resignation, I said, I cannot be a man of integrity and know what's going on here and not do anything about it. I, I can't live with myself. And so I resign. Yeah, I'm going to say something that will probably shock you. I hated this guy. I don't mean I disliked him. I hated him, and I hated him with passion. Now, I didn't quit preaching. I went straight from that church to Springdale. Served there as eight months as their interim, and then went to Crestview and served there seven years as their pastor. And it was three years into my pastorate at Crestview. I knew I had terribly hard feelings, feelings of bitterness, feelings that I wish this guy would just drop dead. I'm, I'm just being honest with you, okay? And I was sitting in the Sunday school class, Christian Baptist Church. I don't even remember what the lesson was about, but I remember how powerfully God spoke to me. He said, you can't keep doing what you're doing with all this hatred you've got in your heart. I've known it all along, I guess. But you know how we mask things? I don't think even Teresa, even though Teresa and I had talked a lot about it and she knew that I was deeply hurt, I, I don't think even Teresa knew how deep my bitterness was toward this guy. 
I hate it. I want him hurt. I wanted God to kill him. Until that day when God convicted me. He literally brought me on my knees before the Holy God in repentance. Because of the feelings of ill will I had for this guy. Now to this day, I can't tell you that I like this man. Okay? I don't like him. But I forgive him. I forgive him because the only way I could get on, move on, continue on in ministry was to get rid of that bitterness, that seed of malice I had in my heart. It was eating me alive. And, and, and for the most part, I didn't even realize the harm it was doing me. I, I had become a bitter person. I want you to know, whatever it is you're harboring in your heart that is causing you to have desire for ill will towards somebody else, you need to get rid of that. You need to purposely decide this morning that I am going to go out of my way to do good to those people who have hurt me. you need to take. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. That's Jesus' words. Let's take that heart today. Father, in Jesus' name, Jesus' words are sometimes so very, very difficult for us to embrace, for us to act upon in faith, for us to believe, for us to put in practice. Father, I've confessed to you, and you know my heart, I've confessed to you that there were those years that I harbored such ill will in my heart toward this one particular person that I think I would have honestly, honestly rejoiced if I had news of his death. Father, it's not my desire now to see him hurt. <laughs> It's my desire to see him restored because he's fallen so far. And it's my heart's desire that if I could ever be a, 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 an instrument that you could use to bring about good in this man's life, that you would use him for that purpose. God, there's possibly some here today who are harboring ill will towards someone for something that was done yesterday or last week or maybe even a decade ago. And, and still harboring hard feelings and bitterness, perhaps even malice. Would you help us to repent of that this morning? Would you help us to make our minds up today that from this day forward we're going to purposely go out of our way to do good to those who have caused us harm. And we'll no longer seek revenge. We'll no longer have the desire to cause hurt. But by your grace, the desire of our life will be to bring good <coughs> so this morning, would you just challenge us? Would you just change us? Would you just help us to be obedient to your teaching, to your word? Would you help us to apply it to our lives for your glory? We pray this in Jesus' name. Let's do it together. As Jerry leads us this morning, I'm just going to invite you to come if you need someone to pray with you. I would be so honored to do that. You just need to come here and make use of this altar to lift your heart. God and just say to God whatever it is you need to say and you just let him have his way. Did you do that? Cheer your please.
victory is found right at the cross. Jesus paid it all. We just need to live our lives unto Him for His glory in all things. Was David a perfect man? Not by a long shot. But on this occasion, he got it right. And I hope that we'll learn from his example and live according to that principle. Just do unto others as you have it doing to you. <coughs> That'll make life pretty miserable for somebody who's going out of their way to cause you hurt and harm. They won't know how to handle that. Just thank God's grace through you be an instrument of conviction to them. Hope you have a great Sunday afternoon, 5 o'clock this afternoon, uh, drama practice, 6 o'clock, we'll continue our study of Lord Change My Attitude. We invite you to come for those, and we look forward to seeing you back here for those. We